I'll do that right now. Um, so today we are going to, what? Oh. Oh, now I. Uh, we're going to talk about what alt text is, what the little bit of the history, uh, and what it does effectively, or how to make it effective. Um, there are two frameworks for um, thinking about how to include everything you should include. Um, I'm going to give an example from uh, some other another workshop that I did with a paleontologist, Sarah Sheffield. Um, and then I'm going to talk about including uh, all text in markdown documents. Um, and then hopefully you've all brought questions, uh, you know, in general about all text or how it works or what it's like to rely on it. I should have mentioned in the kind of introduction, introduction that I do use a screen reader um, and, and don't have access to data visualizations any other way. Um, so alt text is attached to an image uh, on the web. It might be a photo or, um, you know, in the, in the context of R, it, it's likely to be a data visualization or a flow chart or something um, that describes that image so that a person using a screen reader can um, appreciate what you're trying to convey by showing the image. Um, it is required in the US to, you know, conform with accessibility laws. It's really important to have it in educational materials so that you reach everyone. Um, and, um, you know, just to make the point that people with disabilities may not be that visible in the art community, but we are here. Um, and we may not be that visible because of the various barriers that exist. Um, but it's not that that uh, sometimes people think these are, you know, rules and procedures that we follow just to, you know, uh, fulfill some institutional requirement, but it does actually affect people. So what alt text does um, is it will tell me why this image was included. Um, examples of, of telling me that include, uh, you want to describe the relationship between two variables in a graph. You want to show incidents of COVID-19 on a map, either, you know, by states in the US or by counties in a state or something like that. Um, or you might have a group of uh, faceted bar charts where you wanna compare measures uh, and explain what, what that comparison is. Um, so this is a little bit of a grumpy New Yorker thing. Uh, what all text is not, uh, it is not automatically generated by data mining or AI. Um, there are a lot of attempts at this going on. These methods are not smart enough to describe data visualizations uh, in a way that, that conveys any meaning. They can, they can pull out some of the characteristics, but not, not really get at uh, something that kind of takes the human brain to, to understand the relationships between the variables. Um, some of these things are maybe part of an alt text or give information to an alt text, but they are not in themselves an alt text, the title 
particularly in a in a you know academic science context, the title doesn't tell you anything about what the data are saying. They just kind of tell you what things are in the graph. Um, similarly, a caption, especially in an academic context, is not uh, that informative about why you included the graph. Um, access labels, these are all really important things to include, but they are not by themselves a complete alt text. Um, I'm excluding humorous remarks from most alt text. It is, I, I do say it is allowed, um, but uh, it shouldn't be the main point. People are, are using the alt text for really strange things these days, like hiding Easter eggs for sighted people and uh, you know, just completely making a joke and not describing the image and things like that. And that's not cool. Um, the things that are that I listed above usually aren't going to tell you why am I including the data visualization or what the data are saying. Where do we find alt text? Um, it started in HTML on the days that I can remember when the internet wasn't really graphical yet. Um, and then it started to become graphical, but a lot of people were still accessing the web uh, on, with text-based browsers. And so if you didn't, if you only were, were using, you know, Unix and a text-based browser and there was an image, you wouldn't have any, nobody would have any access to it. Um, so the alt tag came along as a way to describe what an image was in that context, especially if it was like uh, an image of an arrow that told you to, you know, click on that to move to the next page or something like that. Um, there's a list here of places that, that you can put or find um, uh, the links here are all um, send you to instructions on how to include alt text in these uh, different media. Um, Office has better and better support for alt text in Word and PowerPoint. Um, if you want to create PDFs with Office, it's really good to make the alt text and set all that stuff up first and then save a PD as a PDF. Um, PDFs created with Adobe Acrobat, which I am not very familiar with myself. Um, Twitter posts now have a field for alt text. And uh, just uh, last week, they announced that they now have a feature that you can turn on that will remind you to add alt text to your posts if you want to be reminded when you forget. Um, Facebook also has instructions and uh, our Markdown documents and Zeringan slides also allow you to do this. Um, so there's a lot of places that are missing alt text infrastructure and I'm gonna ask you to be creative uh, about how you can still, you know, incorporate your description into sharing your data visualizations. So places that aren't set up for alt text yet are academic journals, uh, books, magazines, software that helps you create a lot of these things, uh, also doesn't necessarily have uh, a place for you to, to put the alt text so that it's displayed to the user. Um, so some workarounds for this are, um, you know, put your put your description in the text, maybe be a little bit unusual in, you know, describing the relationship a little bit more fully in a results section, or, um, you know, in a, a journalistic article. Um, and, and just put it in there. 
Um, you can provide text descriptions as supplementary material when you submit an academic article. In social media, if you have used up the limited space that, for example, Twitter, I think gives you a thousand characters, um, you know, you can always say alt text is in the comments below or something like that to make more space for yourself. Although the thousand characters is much bigger than a tweet. Um, the other suggestion is to provide tables that can be navigated with the screen reader. So for example, if you are talking about uh, a, a map of uh, COVID incidents and it is, you know, say color, you know, a different color for, for different levels of incidents for each county. Um, if you put the data in a table by county, the screen reader user will at least be able to access, you know, the names of the counties and their incidences. What will be lost is the, the spatial relationship between the counties, but at least part of the data will be available. So there's a lot of attention to how long alt text should be. And uh, my answer to that is that it depends on the context that you're presenting it in, whether it's uh, social media or journalism or uh, you know academic science article, uh, some of those will lend themselves to including more detail um, and more detail will be necessary to understand some of those. And um, the complexity of the individual data visualization also um, will affect how long the alt text is. Um, you should use your own judgment, even though, um, as I mentioned, some media have limits for alt text. I think too many of the guidelines out there emphasize brevity too hard. Um, and maybe I'm a little bit biased because I'm a scientist and I, um, you know, if I'm if I'm reading a journal article and I, I want to write a literature review or something like that, I really need access to the information. Um, the one or two sentences that some places recommend just just aren't going to be enough for a lot of the data visualizations that are used these days, um, especially as they get you know, there's a lot of innovation going on and that there's a lot more kinds of data visualizations than they used to be and those will require more explanation. Oops. So um, the first model that I'm gonna talk about uh, for the things that should be included for an alt text to be complete is what I've been calling the ingredients model that um, Sylvia Canelon and I um, put together as a result of studying uh, how, many, how many people used alt texts and what the alt texts were like in the Tidy Tuesday data visualization learning community on Twitter. And uh, based on my experience over many years getting uh, colleagues to describe graphs to me, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting distracted by the comments, sorry. Um, Based on my experiences with uh, getting, you know, colleagues and other people to describe graphs to me and knowing what questions I needed to ask to find out what I needed, and also based on reading a lot of alt texts online recently, um, I, the first thing to know is is what kind of data visualization it is. Um, 
Is it a line graph or a scatter plot or a bar chart? If it is one of these newer, more innovative kinds of charts, um, it might be helpful to provide more explanation and context. Uh, the second ingredient would be what variables are on the axes. Um, is there just an X and Y axis? Are there uh, two Y axes? Uh, what, what is kind of the, the general shape and structure? Um, it's a good idea to give some kind of uh, indication of the range of the data or the magnitude or something. Um, and four is the one that often gets missed. I'm not sure why. What is the relationship between the variables that you're showing? Comes back to those questions I mentioned before about, you know, why are you including this in your media or report or paper? And, um, you know, what, what, is it, what is it saying about the data that you found? Um, and I'm gonna be, a, opinionated New York person again, and I'm going to say, I don't want to have to read the first three if I'm not going to get the four. Um, the screen reader reads all text is a big chunk. It's not particularly navigable. I can't tell when I start listening to it whether it'll be complete or not. So it's a real disappointment to read the title and the axes and all that stuff without being able to know what the relationship is that's being shown. Uh, and I have a reference at the bottom of uh, the work that led to the kind of articulation of these four ingredients. So there's also a paper that came out about the same time from the MIT Visualization uh, Research Center that um, took a different approach to uh, content of alt text. And they, they took existing alt texts and they um, you know, got people to classify them and they classified them both in relation to their meaning and to how well they could be automated or how well their production could be automated. So the first level is elements and properties. It's kind of the, the bits and pieces of the graph that you can see. Um, it involves things like the title, the axis labels, the axes themselves. Um, and individual data points. Um, the second level, um, maybe, you know, an increased level of, of cognitive or uh, statistical information is um, the relationships between the variables that are really kind of basic um, where the data points are um, and statistics like, um, you know, mean, range, standard deviation. The third level is cognitive and perceptual phenomena, which are um, really, the one of the most important parts and make up uh, ingredient four from the previous slide. And these are things that you really need a person to think about. Um, and there are some examples here, um, like I, Y increases linear with X. Um, and uh, things like that. The level four is uh, contextual and domain specific insights, which has something to do with bringing knowledge from outside of that graph. Um, it might say something about the cause of a change that's not indicated on the graph. 
Um, it might say that a change is large or small or something that involves knowledge outside of the graph. And we really want to try to avoid including that in alt text. So alt text should be kind of just the facts and not, um, not a level of interpretation that's more than level three. Um, so this is just a little bit more about um, providing links to the actual data um, and examples of, of ways that it would be useful to provide this in um, lots of different settings like a website or in journalism. Um, so an example would be a COVID-19 incidents map, uh, looking up incidents by zip code. Um, if you have a line graph um, with a data set, lets you explore the data set um, and maybe get a better idea than um, what you're able to get. Uh, with with a short alt text or you know limited limited length alt text, um, don't put URLs in alt text. Alt text, as I said, is read as a chunk, and there's no way to activate a URL from uh, inside an alt text. If you have to write it, if it's a simple one, you know you can spell it out. Um, but uh, you know, try to provide that link somewhere else in your media. Uh, so example one is um, Dr. Sheffield is a paleontologist at the University of South Florida. Um, and I'm showing you the alt text first so you can think about um, what the graph might look like. Uh, and we're also going to think about the ingredients or the four levels. And she tells us that it's a graph marking diversity through time. So that's kind of the first ingredient. And she tells us very nicely what's on the, the x-axis is geographic time, geologic time. Um, y-axis is the number of marine families. Um, and she describes how the x axis is marked with the geologic periods. Um, and then she talks about the high points in the uh, in the graph of the uh, time periods. Um, and she describes how each of the mass extinctions are marked and talks about the, the different families in the eras. Mm -hmm. um, and the other point I want to make is, is this, um, this alt text kind of goes off the slide, right? Like use, use the space you need to give a complete picture. Um, if I were a student in her class, I would probably need all of this because it might be on a test or something. Um, and here is the graph. And if you uh, check out these slides on GitHub, the alt text is here and everything. These are these slides are made in Zeringen. Um, and uh, you can see the code and see how to make sure you get alt text in your Zeringen slides. So a little bit more about objectivity and that, that level four from the MIT model. Um, report what you see about the data without adding extra opinion about what it means. So, um, you know, is it, uh, a steadily increasing line. It is. Is it a curve? 
um, is there a maximum point at 6.5? But don't tell me why you think 6.5 is the maximum point unless that's indicated in the graph. Um, so yeah, this is a lot about don'ts. So, um, you know, we don't really wanna know what's good or bad. People's opinions might differ about what's good or bad. Um, we also kind of want, want to be able to interpret this for ourselves. We don't need extra interpretation. We just need a report of, of what's available visually. Um, opinions about variables are really not um, something that people want to hear in all text. Um, small or large changes are um, not really helpful uh, and also really don't conflate correlation with causation. A, a lot of people do this in general, and I think it's probably a really easy temptation in alt text. And this paper that is referenced here is pretty interesting um, as far as, as what researching what people prefer in alt text. And the Lungard paper uh, with the four that describes the four levels is also really helpful. Um, now I want to shift to talk about the options in R for including alt text, but do people want to ask questions before we do that? I don't see questions in the chat, although someone did ask if they can share your slides on social media. Yes, um, the slides are also available on GitHub. Um, it is an accessibility practice to make the slides available in an accessible format at many conferences and workshops and meetups, they don't, but screen sharing on Zoom is not something a screen reader can read. So it's a really good idea to share slides in some location that everybody can access. Um, my GitHub username is Liz Hair Dogs, L-I-Z-H-A-R-E-D-O-G-S. And this whole slide deck is available there. And the link for your slides are also on the Meetup event page. Thank you. It looks like Sylvia has- Hi, Sylvia. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> This has been a great talk so far. So my question is when there's a lot of detail that needs to be written to describe a graph properly, do you have any um, recommendations or opinions on kind of how to structure that given that alt text is like linear? So like you're listening to the, obviously the very beginning first and then the, the end of the description is what you're listening to last. Um, what should we include sort of earlier on versus later on in like a paragraph of alt text, for example? That is a really good question. It, I didn't even plant you there with that one. Because <laughs> um, it points out, using the word linear, points out the fact that the whole screen reader experience is very linear. If I'm on a web page, um, I have to go through each element on that page and it is presented to me linearly as it is programmed, which is not always the same way that a sighted person sees it laid out on the screen. Um, as far as alt text for more complex data visualizations, I think 
kind of a more general to more specific top-down approach would be helpful. Um, maybe starting with, you know, what what kind of graph is this? Um, you know, again, you know, with those four ingredients that we talked about, um, you know, what are the axes? What are the variables? And you might have to then, when you go back to, when you get down to the part where you are talking about what actually is shown by the data, you will just need to use more words to be more specific. For example, if there's multiple variables in one plot, or if you have, um, faceted variables, you know, you might actually, you know, if you have four faceted variables, you might have to have four little sub descriptions. Um, but I think kind of from kind of setting up a framework to understand it and then filling it in with the details of, of what the message is and the data is probably a good approach. Is that too general? That's really helpful. Thank you. Anyone else? I guess I'm curious, um, are there certain types of visualizations that are harder to work with when trying to think about alt text, like I'm thinking of maps versus something like a line graph. And I'm trying to think about how I would describe those two different visualizations. Yeah, maps are different, right? Because the spatial relationship between the different elements is part of or I think is usually part of what, what you want to convey. Um, yeah, I think there are some visualizations that are really difficult because again, I think there are a lot of new kinds. Um, uh, if you look at kind of the variety of what's being done with ggplot um it's it's you know there's a huge variety of innovations and um you know the the graphical interpretation skills that we learned in elementary school maybe won't help us figure out uh some of these more complex displays. I think it gets really hard when you get into um, 3D displays to describe. Um, and this is also kind of related to the idea that uh, someone said, if your data visualization can't be written down in an alt text, maybe you need to go back and think about what the message is that you want to convey or what the story is that you're telling about the data and see if you can, uh, you know, focus in on something relevant to make a less complex visualization. I love that, thank you. Like in the chat, um, someone read that for bar graphs, it's better to include a table with the data instead of a description. What are your thoughts on that, Liz? Well, um, the table is really helpful. It depends a little bit on the, um, the context and kind of what you're allowed to put like in an academic journal, you could definitely submit the table as a uh, as a um, supplementary material um, 
And I, I do understand that people might have to fight with, with editors to get journals to include things like that, um, but it's an equity issue. I think there are any other questions. Okay. Oh, whoop. So there are some places that you can put alt text in your R Markdown or something in, and probably Quarto. I'm sorry, I have not become familiar with Quarto yet. Um, the chunk option where you stash the alt text is fig.alt. Um, I have an example here of a chunk that uses the fig alt to uh, include a graphic with the fig alt set. Um, and, uh, this, um, it's, it's really been kind of fun for me to be able to actually do this and see my images have alt text. Um, you can see examples of, of how to do this in these slides on GitHub. The link is, is there as well. Um, So um, in ggplot, to attach an alt text to a ggplot object, um, um, thanks for the comment, Sylvia. Um, If you want to attach a uh, an alt text to a ggplot object, um, you can do that using the labs um, option to ggplot labs standing for label, um, and alt is the option to make that label item and uh, an alt text as opposed to a title or a subtitle. Um, and that will keep the alt text with that object. And um, you can retrieve, um, not quite as good as a golden retriever, but um, you can retrieve it with ggplot to get alt tech, get underline alt, underline text. This could be useful um, if you are writing for a publication that doesn't include alt text, you could use the get alt text uh, command in in the um, or function in the um, in the text. I mentioned earlier that you could maybe put something like alt text in the results of your paper, um, and this this might be a way to retrieve it. Um, you could also use it as descriptive text somewhere else, or you could make a whole list of them that you could use as a supplementary document for an academic article. Um, so it's important to, if, if you're outside of the chunk that you made the plot in, it's important to make sure that it's available when you ask for it. Um, and I 
had to go look up the fact that a semicolon is the way to have two R commands in an inline um, expression in Markdown. So this process is clunky because um, it's you, you can't really write a good alt text without seeing the visualization you've made. So you can't do it all in one step. You have to um, you know, create your graph and look at it and then edit your RMD before you um, edit your RMD to add the alt text. Um, which, you know, is not an ideal workflow, but I really don't know any other way around uh, needing to look at the, at the, the graph to write the alt text. There's, there's, there's no um, automatic way to do that. I know that our studio at one point was, um, considering proposing uh, having some kind of text mining to get stuff from the title and the access labels and all that stuff to um, populate the alt text field. I'm really glad they apparently didn't because again, it's another source of incomplete alt texts where I get the first three ingredients, but I never get to the one about the meaning. Uh, and it's really uh, time consuming and annoying to have to listen to the data about the data, but not the data. So um, that's pretty much all for uh, alt text in R, but I did want to mention a new package from Elio Campitelli that um, saves the data that the that ggplot puts on your graph. Um, so you can have a CSV file that has each layer of the data that can be accessed. For example, if for some reason you can't provide all text, you can provide the data so that the screen reader user can explore it in whatever methods they generally use to explore data. Um, a GG data saver package um, is useful for accessibility when when there aren't any, there aren't infrastructure, or in general, if you have situations where you want students to be able to explore data, or you're kind of aggregating data and you don't want to, you don't want to share uh, the individual data points. But if you're plotting means or other summary statistics, that's what will be uh, in the resulting file. Um, so that package should be really useful for people looking to make supplementary accessibility uh, accommodations that aren't directly alt text, but are related and help some of the same people. And um, I am looking forward to questions. And before we get started with that, I'd like to thank our ladies NYC for this opportunity for this conversation we're going to have, and to uh, Dr. Sarah Sheffield for the paleontology example, and to Sylvia Kainalon for the Zerini theme. Thank you very much. Liz. It's been a pleasure to have you. I'm also very excited to see uh, the visualizations and workshop. Thanks, on. Elio. <laughs>
Thanks, Sylvia. Uh, yes, I had a question. Um, awesome. Just in general, um, so a lot of times visuals are are moving into more of like a live almost dashboard where you know you see one visual and that's maybe month over month, but then you see year over year, year to date, rolling twelve months. You know, allowing people to cut it a lot of different ways. How can you be conscious of you know alt text while still enabling kind of all of those different views of trends in a way? Um, that's a really, really difficult issue um, because each view is created from real-time data, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's just really difficult because um, that, that human piece of interpretation that has to happen um, can't be there. Um, I mean, I, I guess, you know, you could say, um, you know, this is a dynamic, you know, program that provides graphs of variable X and variable Y, but um, in R at this time, I mean, I, I think people are working on, I know people are working on sonification of graphs, and I know people are working on SVG graphs that would be more na navigable with a screen reader so that you could actually um, have some access into reading the uh, the data points or or other elements. Um, but we're not really there yet with those kinds of things. Yeah, no, because yeah, we use um, our shiny a bit. And so like those kind of cuts and ability. Um, but presenting I them as tables, I'm not really sure um, how accessible shiny things are, but but having an option to see them as tables instead of bar charts would be excellent. Yeah, that's great. Because and it was also interesting to hear about sometimes it you could think to maybe call out something, but you don't want to kind of lead the observation mm -hmm. as an opinion. Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. very um, helpful to hear. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really good question, Elio. Um, I I don't know of one. Um, I am I I've, I've written a chapter for a freely available book that will be coming out in December. Um, that has a few examples and and more of the things that were discussed here. Um, but I. That's that's that would be a really good resource. Jocelyn, I think. Yeah, <clears throat> Jocelyn is speaking here. Hi, Liz. It's Hi. Really nice to hear you. Thank you. Yeah. So Thanks for coming. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Um, so from the different options that you showed us today. If you have to prioritize them or kind of uh, give them a hierarchical order of you prefer ones, which one the best one? Like, which is the, the number one of these options? Which options? Like uh, the way for providing the, the alt text uh, uh, 
I'm not sure if pro probably like, um, let's say from the armor down, mm -hmm. uh, option in the chunk is the best one, or probably um, this option created with the function from Ilio is the best option. I'm not sure if- Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um... I think it depends a whole lot on the context. So again, I do science. So, um, you know, I, I read academic journals a lot and, and the journal publishers just don't even have a place for alt text. So Ilio's package would be awesome for that. Um, I think if you're posting something on social media or, um, writing a more an article for more of a general audience i think maybe the alt text is better um i mean elio's awesome package is only going to work for people like me who know r it's not going to work for students who don't know r yet or people in other fields who don't know r yet um, I mean, I guess if it, if it outputs a, the zip file containing CSV files for each layer, so you could import it with other statistical software, but it is going to require a certain amount of, of knowledge that people might not have. So if you think that part of the audience won't be familiar with statistical computing, you might prefer the alt text. Yeah, got it. Thank you so much, Liz. Any other questions? Anybody want to take a shot at, at sharing a graph or a chart with all text you've written? It is the third of all the, uh, the question was, what is the name of the book that'll be coming out in December? Uh, the Urban Institute in the US um, has is publishing a series of books um, that are available in PDF uh, called the Do No Harm Guides. And they are about the ethics of data, um, using data, visualizing data, things like that. Um, this will be the third volume, and it is, um, it's all about accessibility of data visualizations, and it will cover um, not just screener use, but the different issues that people with low vision have, like contrast, fonts, sizes, and things like that. It will also um, address different types of disabilities other than visual. So, um, you know, kind of cognitive accessibility, how to kind of minimize the cognitive load associated with interpreting your data visualization and things like that.
Um, if anybody has a visualization but doesn't have the alt text yet, is that an option, Liz? Could we yeah. workshop the alt text? Sure. <laughs> I am. I have like uh, you had mentioned maps earlier as like something that's a little harder to alt text. So right. I have a map from a report that I helped to write a while ago, and it's a little confusing. So it's a map that happens to have a lot of text on it, but mm -hmm. so it's not alt text. It's text that's physically on right. the side of the map. And I just wanted to show to see if like would a subset of that text be okay to be the alt text for this map that was shown in a different format, maybe. So I don't know, should I share my screen or should I drop a link to the report? What's the best way to? Thanks for coming, the person who's leaving. <laughs> should I stop screen sharing to let someone else? Yes, I think so. Okay. Oops. All right. I think your screen is still. Sorry? Uh, your screen is, uh, is it going to let me show? Oh, yeah. Um, hang on. Okay. Okay, so this is the map on the right. Great. And there's a ton of text already on the map, but, and this is a pretty comprehensive, I think, on that map, like it's a pretty comprehensive description of what's going on, like maybe all of that is not good for alt text, but I was wondering if that's the kind of idea, um, like would a subset of that text be okay, or should it go more into more detail as like what's also being represented on the map in the legend and stuff. So I actually can't see what you're showing. So this is like real practice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, so it's a map of senior pedestrian zones in New York City. And should I just read out the text? Yeah. So yeah, on the map, on the left side of the map, it says senior pedestrian zones represent the areas of the city with the highest rate of senior pedestrian injury relative to senior population. They are based on neighbor, neighborhood tabulation geographies and reflect the highest 20% of neighborhoods ranked by senior pedestrian injuries per senior residents. Uh, neighborhoods with a low senior population below the citywide mean less one standard deviation are excluded. The senior pedestrian zones include 19% of the citywide senior population, 33% of citywide senior pedestrian injuries, 31% of citywide senior pedestrians killed or severely injured, and 13% of citywide square mileage. So, so when thinking about this, my first question would be, what's the context? So it was in a report um, and you have a lot of cool, information about your methods right in the visualization mm -hmm. um if that information is also available in the text of the report i might not put it in the alt text yeah so the context of it is that um, um i was at the new york city department of transportation we did a years long study on senior pedestrian safety so how often um pedestrian where basically pedestrians 65 and older um, more likely to be injured in certain areas than adults, right. than younger adults. Um, so yeah, some of the detail on the methodology might be left out if, if it's available elsewhere in the report. Okay. Um, and providing only that text doesn't tell me which neighborhoods are bad for seniors. So you still need to tell me that. Okay, so maybe like a list of the areas that are the most dangerous would be helpful. Yeah, and maybe a list of the areas that are safest or something. Okay. Um, 
how many different categories are there? Uh, we only have on this specific map, it only has the most dangerous neighborhoods. We didn't oh, think okay. the safest because the okay, okay, the okay, yeah, then, 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 yeah, that's 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 all you need to list then if that's all it's shown on the graph you really just want to stick with what's on the graph like um okay the only other thing there's another layer for uh vision zero priority corridors which are the 50 most dangerous i believe it's the 50 most dangerous um streets yeah, in like new york city so, yeah well we take all that the streets in new york and rank them so yeah there's just a lot of streets yeah yeah um, yeah but so that might be a lot to list the top 50, but should I yes. just say this is overlaid with the top 50? Yeah. Um, yeah, and again, depending, you might make it available in supplementary data. Um, you might make some sort of table where people could look up the neighborhood or the street and see what level of danger it has. Um, because a lot of times with this kind of visualization, you you you're really uh, maybe interested in where you live and where you work and uh, specific places. Um, so if you can't see that on the map, you might still want to know uh, the information about about specific areas. So it may be a place where a supplementary table would be helpful. Okay. That's very helpful. I make a lot of maps. So just having a good, yeah. that was like my big question today is that like the main visualization I make is maps and they can be a bit more complicated yep. and you can't always yeah. map. Yeah, and they can show a lot of things at once and stuff. You know, I definitely, um, you know, the, the table is not quite as good because it doesn't show the spatial relationships between the units of area. But it's still good to be able to look up the specific areas that might be important to you. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing then. But uh, thank you for the feedback. That was very helpful. Thank you. This was what I was hoping to help people with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have another visualization similar, just um, a picture of kind of some R graphs and would love uh -huh. your feedback. One second. Oh, I think I the sharing is disabled. Yes, I think I have to make you a co-host. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And then you'll have sharing permissions. Awesome. All right. Screen. Okay. So I if you see kind of two graphs to the left and right. Um, what we kind of in, uh, in my role, um, doing kind of just looking at HR files is we look at pay equity gaps. And so what you see here, so the visuals that if you can see, but if not, is a I visual represent. Okay. So, um, <laughs> what it is, it is a, a distribution, um, where the, uh, X axis is the standard deviations of whether or not you are uh, far away from your predicted pay or you are either you are considered either a negative outlier or a positive outlier in your pay predictions. So, you know, we estimate a pay for an individual employee, they are paid something actually, what's the difference? Um, when you move to the left hand side, that means you are underpaid. If you move to the right, you are overpaid. And then Obviously, that creates a natural distribution, but then we tried to create two comparison groups, um, and in particular being men versus women. And so you see, in general, within a company, are the distribution between men and women equal, or are there gaps? Um, particularly, are there more overpaid um, men versus underpaid women, just in general? 
And depending on how the distribution lies is where we recommend adjustments. And so this, we would always kind of show different distribution graphs, but we would love to know how to make, and again, kind of what I referenced before is this would be done in like an R shiny. So you can kind of cut it different ways. You can maybe switch from men versus women to white versus non-white, um, those different things. So we'd love to get your feedback on how to make this maybe more alt text inclusive. Yeah, I think again, a, a, a parallel table would probably be helpful. I, um, if these are created dynamically so that every time a person loads it, it might have different data, it's really hard to uh, think about how to do alt text for that. Um, I mean, the if, one thing that doesn't change is that, I mean, the standard, D, it's always between negative four and positive four. So, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the axis won't change and it's always, it represents 100% of the employee population. So I think the frame mm -hmm. won't change. It's more, um, what I was getting at cuts is say, you want to look, you know, with the US or just, you know, right. Washington DC. Right or just New York, right. and how do you, um, right. how does the frame stay put, but the inputs kind of change over the world? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, I, yeah, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, thanks, Sylvia. Um, what were you gonna say? Oh, no, I was just going to um, bring up another point of just um, like kind of our like a typical thing we would say with these two visuals is how like the distribution kind of on the left hand side is a bit more overlapped so less of an issue versus maybe a visual mm -hmm. on the right has more of a shift where there is maybe a more unexplained differences in pay and well that's that's and that's, that's kind the of what fourth I don't want ingredient. To say. That's the good part, right? That's why, that's why you made this graph was so you could compare those things. And I would love your opinion on like how do I say, kind of that without kind of making it an opinion, but just maybe stating pieces of information. Because that's not an opinion. You're just describing the shapes of the distribution and how the shape differs. That's an observation more than an opinion. Oh no, that's, oh, that's great. The, the, what would be not so helpful is if you gave some reason for the difference that wasn't part of the graph or part of your report or anything. Oh, right. Like the reason for the difference. Um, yeah, if you made up some, you thought you knew the reason for the difference. Oh, I was about to say, I, was say I thought you asked that question. I was like, I don't know. Yeah, no, 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 no. That's not part of it. And that's so, right. so that shouldn't be part of an alt text. But what you were doing was you were just describing the shapes of the graph and how they were different. And that's like exactly what needs to happen. Yeah, no, but to be transparent, I've never used alt text. So yeah, it's this is very helpful to kind of how do we make it yeah. more inclusive? Because we do use these graphs all the time in our line of work. So mm -hmm. just want to try to get more inclusive. Yeah, I think considering also having tables to go with them. Right. I don't have a lot of experience. Um, you know, I know they've done a little bit of work with accessibility on shiny tables, but I, I, I haven't really tried it out. Me neither. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Also, I, you know, this is my point of view, but maybe some of the people who are able to see the graphs might also have suggestions.
I have a technical question. Um, sure. So when tr uh, trying to write all text in R for a ggplot graph, mm -hmm. you mentioned the labs function and then mm -hmm. using the alt parameter in that function. Mm -hmm. um, is there a limit on the amount of text you can write there? I don't know. Okay. Um, um, I mean, I just tried to use it with short phrases and things. I didn't uh, try challenging the length. <laughs> right. I, yeah. I haven't seen anything in the documentation about the length. Okay. And so then I guess my next question is, if I have a lot of text that I want to put there, but I don't want to have it all there in my ggplot, uh, can I save my text to an object and then reference that object in that function parameter? It depends on how you want to use it later. Um, you can save text anywhere you'd like, and then, or you could use the chunk option instead of using the ggplot option. And would, so would the text go in the chunk option then, the alt text? Yes, it's the fig.alt chunk okay. option. Got it, all right. That's helpful. Um, the reason I ask is because I do have a figure um, and it's a fairly simple, graph. It's um, a line graph with three lines that represents uh, three different models that were run. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, you know, describing the elements of the graph and the trends of those lines wouldn't take up too much text. But in order to understand um, what to take away from this mm -hmm. image, right, I would mm -hmm. need to explain uh, what the concept of area under the curve and what that mm -hmm. means for predictive performance. And I feel like that would take a while. Well, of you don't have to say what it means for predictive performance. You can just say the area under the curve looks like this. Okay. So, uh, so you're going to teach the statistics in the alt text. Okay. Got it. Again, it's context, right? If this is going in a journal or something, um, you right. know, you don't necessarily have to explain all the statistical methods. Okay. So if I just explain that one of the lines uh, has sort of a larger area under the curve than the mm -hmm. other lines, that would mm -hmm. be enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe is it relevant whether they're increasing or decreasing? Uh, yes. Well, it, it typically in these types of graphs that are um, uh, showing the uh, performance of the models, of the predictive models, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. lines are always going to be sort of decrease, uh, increasing along the like diagonal, diagonal mm -hmm. line, x, mm -hmm. y line. Mm -hmm. So you might mention that you might say, you know, if you can make a generalization like that, you have these three variables that you're showing in this graph, and you can make a generalization that they all, they all increase and whether that, you know, they increase linearly or exponentially. Um, and, you know, if you can say, you know, they all increase with a similar shape and the one with the greatest area under the curve is A and the middle area under the curve is B and the least area under the curve is C. That would be, that would be a way to convey both the shape and the magnitude. Okay, great. I'm gonna play around with the uh, chunk option now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so frustrating that, you know, you have to do it in multiple step, steps because you just can't, you can't really do the alt text until you see what you've made. Yeah, that's true. Although I feel like I go back and 
write about my figure after the fact anyway. So uh, it's kind of simple. Good point. Good point. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, there is a way I, I can't remember offhand. There is a way um, to, oh, that wouldn't help. Never mind. Any other questions or graphs? Okay, hey, I don't think so. And we are just about at the hour and 30 minute mark for this workshop. So uh, I can say a little more if people have yeah. questions or. Um... Yes, oh, thank you, Lydia. I, that's a great reminder. So um, I will be, uh, posting or uploading this recording to YouTube, and uh, it will have captions. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks, Jocelyn.